thanks all for uh, joining. Um, I'm excited about this uh, second edition coming out. Um, uh, Meredith mentioned uh, Beauty of Books. Um, I also want to say Avanet is another source, uh, and I'll, I'll have a, a slide on that at the end here. Um, this is not the actual cover. This is a Photoshop version of it. Um, so I'm hoping it looks a little better than this uh, once it's uh, once it's out. Okay. okay. Um, I always like to put in abstracts so that um, when people randomly find this on uh, our video site later, um, they can read this and know what it's about and probably say, yeah, you got better things to do. Um, so, uh, that abstract was for a talk I gave to the Western Bird Banding Association in September, and uh, that was a group that used that was largely comprised of banders, so they kind of all knew what was going on. But I think today there'll be a lot more folks who maybe would be interested in kind of the history of this and why it's important. Um, so I added a few slides on that, where it all began. This is my mom here. Um, can hey Meredith, can you see the cult cursor? I forgot to check on that. Uh, um, yes, I can. Oh, good. Okay. Um, in 1961, holding a saw wet owl in our backyard in Washington, D.C., and this is where I got my started on my uh, birds, my interest in birds. Uh, this is actually not me, my younger brother, but I was right there. And then uh, this is also not me. This is uh, David Sibley, in fact at PRBO, but this is the this is where I was about at at about this age, taking birds out of mist nets and trying to figure out um, uh, you know what this was all about. Okay, so um, then uh, we moved to Hawaii, and uh, that's primarily where I grew up. But then we in high school, I moved back to we moved back to the d c area, and um, I actually was able to to get a lot of training and banding from Kathy Klimkowitz of the Bird Banding Lab and others in the Maryland re region. And uh, this Audubon Naturalist Society Wooden Sanctuary in Bethesda, Maryland uh, is a, a piece of property and they wanted to learn about the birds. So they actually hired me when I was 14 years old to uh, run a ba banding station here. Um, and uh, I, I had to, my dad and convinced Kathy Klinkowitz that I could get a, a sub permit under him, even though I was underage. Okay, then after uh, college, I ended up going to the Point Reyes Bird Observatory and uh, at the invitation of Dave DeSanti, the Palomarin Field Station there. And, um, and uh, this is where I, you know, sort of thrived in banding and uh, ended up uh, <laughs> staying. I'm still in the area. Um, and Dave was pretty instrumental in um, in uh, my development of the identification guide. And I'll, I'll talk about that a little later as well. Uh, Dave unfortunately passed away uh, last month while he was chasing a rare bird. So uh, so he's in our thoughts a lot and especially mine as, as the second edition is rolling out. Okay, so why is aging and sexing birds in the hand by banders important? Well, Meredith mentioned our MAPS uh, program. And, um, you know, in order to, MAPS stands for Monitoring Avian Productivity and Survivorship. And actually, productivity as well as survivorship relies on the accurate aging and sexing of birds in the hand. You have to be able to tell the young birds from the adults. And then when the adults return, um, it's very also very important to tell the first year birds, the second or in banding terminology, the SYs that are a year old and breeding for the first time from older birds. And so that's what this guide is all about. It's, it's to help us um, uh, collect as accurate as possible data on the ages and sexes of birds for banding, which then gets incorporated into maps data sets and other banding data sets, which in turn, helps us conserve birds, understand habitat and so forth. I'll talk a little bit about that later. So when I got to uh, PRBO in 1980, um, the, uh, the, the going manual for aging and sexing birds was this. And I wanna emphasize uh, selected species down here because these species, you can see that 
Merrill S. Wood, who produced this, was from Pennsylvania, and the selected species were all Eastern, East Coast species. There was nothing from Western North America. So uh, Dave said, hey, can you make similar sheets to what was in wood for, you know, about 50 species that was caught at Palom, that were being captured at um, PRBO Palom Rin Station. And, um, and uh, so that we can help with that. So I took that role on in uh, 1981 and produced those sheets and actually word processing had just started so so I learned my word processing then too and I was excited to be able to copy one file and to the next one and just change the species names I mean before that we were all using pens and papers so this was a good a big uh, a big new revolution after um, PRBO I went to the Falstabu bird observatory or Fogel Station in Sweden. Uh, here, the map up here shows where it is. It's at the very southeastern, southwestern tip of Sweden. And um, did an internship there for a fall, and, and we caught thousands of European birds. Um, and there I met uh, Lars Svensson, the author of this book at the time, Identification Guide to European Passerines. So he took me around the country uh, to look for white-tailed eagles which we didn't ever see. But in the process, uh, we talked a lot about aging and sexing, and he more or less convinced me that we needed to do a North American version of this. So I came, um, so, and I put in a, a photo of a, a European robin because the, the day I banded the most birds in my life was at Faustabu when I banded 960 uh, European robins. I just sat on the floor banding, aging, letting go, banding, aging, letting go. And I think we caught 1,600 birds that day in one day. So you can see that Falstaboo's at the end of this tip where a lot of birds end up uh, concentrating during big migration days in the fall. Okay, so uh, I, Lars um, convinced me in 1980 to do this, and, and I went ahead, and it took about seven years to get this out, but I got the Identification Guide to North American Passerines out, and the authors on this were Steve Howell, Robert Eunuch, and Dave DeSani. Here's Dave uh, back in the 80s. Here's Steve Howell, along with myself, or as I like to say, Comandante Marcos, uh, without his mask. And uh, here's Bob Eunuch. So the four of us collaborated on putting this first version together and it only included passerines. And it was rather, I think, rudimentary looking back. It, it kind of mirrored what was in the Merrill S. Wood guide, but there wasn't a whole lot um, in it. You know, it sort of focused on plumages of birds and where those species are that have plumages that differ a lot. For instance, say S.Y. indigo buntings in the spring you know, you can tell those two apart, uh, the SYs and the ASYs, but it never, you know, molt limits and all of the things we've learned since then uh, were not part of this guide. So then, uh, oh yeah, here's a, a website that, that sort of portrays the newer edition of Svensson along with, with that guide as the two, two things to look at. So between 87 and 97, we learned a whole lot. And, um, and especially about the use of molt limits um, yeah, to age birds. There was a paper from Powder Mill that Mulvihill and other, Lieberman and others did on using molt limits in e Eastern species. And so I applied that. I, I went into the specimens collections and figured out molt limits for basically about 400 birds um, and, and the ranges of variation because those end up being the most important things to use to age birds in the hand. Um, also between these two revisions, I added 90 non-passerine land bird species. So all the doves, cuckoos, owls, night jars, hummingbirds, woodpecker. And I also treated all subspecies. You know, I wanted to put little couplets in about the subspecies of each species. Um, so that was a big, big difference between the 87 and 97 editions. So now we're up to 2022, and um, what have we learned since 1997? And that edition came out. Well, we've learned a whole lot more, <laughs> as it turns out, which um, which I've uh, been uh, happily incorporating into the 2022 edition. Um, 
The most important update, I think, is that molten plumage terminology has improved and has been updated from this uh, 1997 version to the 2022 version. And before 1997, uh, the the molt, the first molt that young birds do out of the nest was called the first prebasic molt, according to the terminology we use by Humphrey and Parks. Um, but there was a problem with that, it because the first prebasic molt was very variable, and um, and it really didn't match other prebasic molts, which were largely complete in adult land birds. So there was a lot of confusion about Humphrey and Parks' use of this term, and what. How it all did was they ended up renaming the prejuvenile molt, the molt that goes that the birds develop in the nest, as the first prebasic. So it's complete, and then that ended up aligning the second prebasic molt, which occurs in all birds at about a year of age. Uh, and then we needed a new term for that partial molt. They call it an inserted molt in the uh, first cycle, and came up with preformative molt. And so I've done a lot of slideshows on this basic change in, in terminology. And uh, these are the images I use uh, for how everybody felt about going from first pre-basic, where there was a lot of fear and apprehension about molt because it was just made it very difficult to understand to the use of preformative. And I've taught a lot of workshops on aging and sexing birds, both before and after this change. And um, and the uh, and the results are basically how Lucy the Lucy the monkey looks here. So what this means is that uh, in the old edition we have this phrase for every bird: the prebasic molts hatch year partials. So that means the first prebasic molt. Well, now we've changed it to PF preformative partial. Um, so that really is going to change this. And then PBs indicate the second prebasic molt and on. Uh, we continue to call the first prebasic molt the prejuvenile molt just for to, to because it is rather a unique molt within a, a bird's life cycle. Uh, but then from the second prebasic molt on, um, they basically in most land birds they're very similar. So so th th this uh, PBs incorporates all. And what this also means is that all of the birds um, in part one now match those of part two, which is on water birds and raptors. And so we've got uh, we've got 731 species, and 2000, over 2,000 subspecies are treated with standardized molt and plumage terminology between the two guides. And this is probably the thing I'm most happy about um, with with this addition is that now. Uh, I've looked at molts and plumages in all 731 North American species, and I wanted to apply a standard terminology. And uh, really, the Humphrey Parks terminology is based on the evolution of molts. Um, and so it can be applied in a standard way to all birds around the world. And uh, so that's uh, that's something I'm, I'm happy about now, that at least all 731 species in North America use this molt terminology, and it's been standardized. So we've also learned some more things about the terminology and um, improved the terminology in some cases. Um, here are some papers. Uh, and by the way, all of the papers, all of the papers I'll be showing uh, here are available at, the, at our website uh, at BirdPop. It's under publications and, it's, and there's a database. And so PDFs are all downloadable there. Um, so, for instance, um, in in Impidinax flycatchers, uh, we were able to clarify the molt terminology for birds that winter that primarily molt on the wintering grounds. So they undergo two molts on the wintering grounds, and it was very unclear how those two molts separated on the wintering grounds. Um, and now, with the improved uh, terminology, where it, it makes it a lot clearer, and we're able to actually compare these molts. Uh, more closely, like the difference between the preformative mold and the first pre-alternate mold on the wintering grounds is now really clear. So that's that's a, a big improvement between the uh, an example of a big improvement between the two guides. Um, and um, in this uh, 
uh, Journal of Avian Biology paper, uh, we kind of go through why this is an important change and also point out that the older terminologies um, preferred still by a lot in Europe um, kind of are, are unable to distinguish these malts on the wintering grounds uh, because they sort of have the same terms for both the malts. So, uh, so this paper uh, shows that. So here's uh, figures from that second paper, uh, summer tanagers showing how they malt in the first cycle, they'll molt first on the uh, summer grounds. And, and male summer tanagers are a good species to study because as time goes on through the first year, the feathers go from, from pale yellow to mustard color to, to red. And so you can kind of get a feel for what time of the year of the cycle uh, each of these feathers got replaced. And what we learned was that preformative molt can go all the way into spring and then kind of overlap with the first pre-alternate molt that, that starts, starts again a new sequence. So the important way to define these two molts is the sequence of feather replacement, uh, not necessarily the color, although for summer tanager it was useful. And so for yellow-bellied flycatcher, for instance, uh, we, we changed the, we thought the adults had incomplete molts on the wintering grounds, but once we make this terminology, terminological change, everything becomes clearer. So another um, application that will be part of the uh, second edition here is, is putting in WRP codes. Now these are different um, codes uh, than, than calendar-based codes. Uh, that we can now apply to all birds um, because uh, around yeah, yeah. the world, no. the calendar base codes no, don't, necessarily, um, don't necessarily um, yep. uh, apply to uh, birds that, that say breed in the tropics. So we've come up with this new system based on the revised Humphrey and Parks terminology, uh, which should, which should um, uh, help clarify the age terminology that we use and it can it can occur in um, North America as well this coding system uh, the WRP system um, is uh, is it, what I want to emphasize with that system is that there's only 12 core codes that most banders will want to use and those will cover all of the birds now there's been a lot of development with the WRP system a lot of the confusion re resulted from birds that were would be classified as unknown in some way in banding data. For instance, um, what we call AHYs in um, in um, summer in the MAPS program. It means we don't know if they're second year birds or older. Um, and you know those those birds end up kind of getting tossed out of data sets anyway. At least those in which you want to examine. Um, uh, yearling proportions, for instance. So this uh, new emphasis is on these core codes, and really for maps, there's probably only about eight that that you need to use, and that covers all of the bases. And then you can also use unknown codes in different ways, which will end up not being part of final analyses. Okay, now I'm kind of. Okay, here we go. So the WRP format in the um, in the new edition will look like this. I've just got a, a stanza that gives the groups, and that's groups that were defined by Johnson and Wolf's book on uh, molt and neotropical birds, which which has a very good and thorough summary of the WRP system. And all of the um, codes and what month ranges you would expect the WRP codes to occur uh, within birds, within, within the birds caught in North America. And then also <clears throat> within each couplet now, I'm following the part two by indicating the cycle and then also uh, a range of uh, WRP codes that can be applied. And these are not the ones that include the unknowns. And then the month range. I've done a different format here for the month range to indicate, for instance, June to May slash October means that an HYSY can be caught as early as June, but
but can still be identified in October of the next year. So this format here indicates like about a 16 month period um, from June to May and then on through to October. So I think that's gonna help clarify the, the usage of these codes and, and, when, and when they'd be important to use. Now WRP, um, there's a lot of good um, uh, webinars and so forth on the use of WRP and at our IBP video recordings page, you can <clears throat> you can play a couple of uh, videos, one specific to the MAPS program. And here's one that uh, Ramiro Aragon and I did for uh, for Latin Americans who use this uh, coding system frequently because the calendar system doesn't work down there uh, in both English and Spanish. OK, what else have we learned? Um, more research on molts and plumages have also occurred. Um, here's one. Uh, I gave a talk for the uh, Western Field Ornithologists, and I called this uh, going down a rabbit hole. The, the uh, edition uh, probably took two, three months longer than it should have because I. what happens is I get excited by a question, and then I have to go and do a separate analysis to find something out and, um, and then incorporate that into the new edition. So. So this was one of those, um, and it's the examination of digital images from Macaulay Library. And the important thing about this is that uh, I think Macaulay Library now has this become the best resource to use to understand molts and plumages of birds around the world. And I'll, I'll have a little bit more on that later. But <clears throat> what I did for this analysis was I uh, cleared up the molts and plumages of eight species of hummingbirds that that kind of occur in the southern, along the southern border of the United States. Um, we have 16 species of hummingbirds in North America and the eight that are highly migratory and occur throughout the, the continent basically are pretty well known for molts and plumages, but these uh, eight species were not, were not well known at all. And, um, and the, um, so I had to sort of start clarifying the molts and plumages and I thought, oh, let me check Macaulay, and this was a couple of years ago. And I went, oh, huh, look, I can learn a lot about the molts and plumages of these birds through Macaulay, in Macaulay Library. And that's what led to this paper here. So for broad-billed hummingbird, for example, these three resources on hummingbirds had completely different information um, about the molt and plumages, different times of year, what ages did what, and all three authors indicated that um, the preformative molts were complete and that the pre-basic molts could be protract, protracted and often suspended. So, but when I dug into the Macaulay, I ended up uh, looking at 27,581 images. Um, and in, for instance, for broad-billed hummingbird, I looked at 8,000, over 8,000 images of over 2,400 individuals including for instance, 639 in July. So I looked at it for month by month and scored it for a different molt. And also I looked at the sequence of molt. Hummingbirds have an interesting sequence in which they go from inner to outer and then P10 drops before P9 drops. So that's kind of a odd, uh, that's an interesting sequence that actually is shared by um, Herons, um, for some reason, uh, probably not related. But um, at any rate, I was able to confirm that not only this sequence occurred in all species, all eight species, and I'm sure it probably occurs in all hummingbirds, but also I was able to clarify the sequence amongst the secondaries. There's only six secondaries in hummingbirds, and S4, it turns out, the, the middle of those is always the last one to be replaced. It's important to know which feathers last to be replaced because that's often the last one that's um, held on to by the uh, last juvenile feather held on to, so you can still uh, age a bird based on its last feather. And then I ended up being able to define the preformative mold, second prebasic mold, and definitive prebasic mold in all of the species. And nobody of those three resources was even close to. 
understanding how it all went. So this was an example of using Macaulay Library to really advance our understanding about molts in a group of species. So perform, and then the performative molt also varies a lot between all of these species. It was considered complete by those by everybody before this, but it turns out that it's only partial or incomplete in most of the species. So we were able to then apply uh, a better molt and plumage terminology to the hummingbirds based on these new findings. Okay, and then I was also in the process of doing this, um, put together a uh, age and sex guide for each of the eight species using Macaulay images as examples. And this is also available at our, it's a supplementary material file available at um, the IVP site. So the big conclusion, well, the big broad conclusion here is that the Macaulay Library is clearly a significant resource to study molts. And what one of my other roles here is to um, be revising the appearance section of the Birds of the World accounts. And we're revising birds all over the world now, and a lot of them have absolutely nothing written about a molt. And so I'm able to go in um, to Macaulay Library which, by the way, has over 40 million images now, and filter to month and date and age and so on for whatever species in the world. And I'm I'm slowly but surely um, advancing or or clarifying molts and plumages in 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 all these these species all over the place. One thing about Macaulay, though, is that so Macaulay, most of the images um, uh, con contributed there are through eBird. And uh, for the hummingbirds, for instance, 76.5% of, of the males were adults like this. And that's fine. It looks pretty. 23.5% uh, were first years. Now, which of these, which of these is more informative for molts and plumages? Well, nothing's going on here. And these beautiful images don't tell us a whole lot. But these images of ratty molting birds or first year birds are the ones that really we can learn a lot. So one of my messages to all of those who contribute photos to eBird is to don't ignore the birds that are trashed looking or in molt, especially those in molt, active molt, because taking photographs of birds in active molt is gonna help us um, understand where their molting locations. Um, and uh, I'll get to that in a second too, I think. Um, and that's going to help us conserve habitats needed by these birds to molt. But birds are kind of retiring when they molt and they look bad. And it's August in the Northern Hemisphere and everybody's on vacation. And so there's not a lot of photos of birds in active molt at Macaulay. So I'm making a call to everybody to help add some more photos. And then let's not uh, ignore the females either. Here's another thing. 79% of my sample for broad-billed hummingbirds were male and only 21% were female. Well, certainly a lot going on with females too. So that it's really kind of dumb that we um, that we emphasize the male so much. Okay, so as I mentioned, um, we've also learned a lot about where birds molt, not 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 just uh, their timing and extent, but um, for instance, uh, since uh, 1997, we've done a lot of work on what we know, what we call molt migration or birds that, for instance, Lazuli bunting and black-headed grosbeak breed here in the in the western region, fly here to the monsoon region to molt, and then go down to area C here, the wintering re region, uh, to winter. So they essentially have a three-part migration. And there's about 19 species that we were able to document uh, through banding stations down in um, northwestern Mexico and southeastern Arizona uh, in, uh, that end up doing that. And there's probably even more. And one of the things we also have learned is that there's a tendency to think, oh, this is a molt migration species. So all 100% of the birds do this. And that's not true either. Molt, unfortunately, is, is complicated. and kind of stochastic. So probably 75% at least of the Lazuli Bundings do this, but a few will stick around here to molt, a few will go to Southern Cal, 
a few will go all the way to the wintering grounds to molt. So, so there's some play in there on exactly um, the strategies that each individual uses. And it's probably related to uh, breeding, you know, resource availability on the summer or whether or not they were successful breeders or not. That seems to play a role in whether or not they might molt, uh, migrate to molt and where they go. So another paper we did was we looked at this using the MAPS data for all of the birds in North America. And we found out there's quite a few bird species that do not molt where they breed. The, the thought before was that a bird would, these birds that need, that, that molt on the summer grounds, in other words, don't do molt migration, would just hang around uh, their breeding territory and molt after they were done. But that's not the case because the breeding territory, first of all, is probably exhausted by um, in resources from feeding the chicks and all. And then also um, uh, the, the nutrients that birds need and the amount of cover that birds need to molt isn't necessarily gonna be found on the breeding territory. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm venturing to say that most birds leave the breeding territory to molt and where they molt is still a big question and is one that uh, we're gonna work on and in, in particular what habitats the birds need to molt because those need to be conserved just as well, just as much as breeding and wintering habitats need to be conserved. Um, we've made some advances in the molt in woodpeckers and have found that, that um, examining the exact patterns of replacement of primary coverts and secondaries, we can identify some third cycle birds or ones that we would call TY in the fall and 4Y in the spring. Um, so that's an advancement. Woodpeckers are, have a very interesting molt pattern in which they do not molt primary coverts, all of their primary coverts until at least their third year, and in some cases their fourth year. So here's a, that's another advance that we made. I've done a lot of work on molts and owls as well, and owls are interesting in that the sequence varies starting at uh, P6 or P5, depending on the genus, um, or even P7, and going both ways from there. So uh, here, this is a great gray owl in California that we were able to document two different years and see which feathers replaced were replaced between year one and year two to help us try to understand the precise molt patterns that owls undergo. So what else? Uh, I, I didn't think there'd be a whole lot of new papers to incorporate between 97 and 22, but I was wrong. Um, I ended up reading 1,295 more papers to, uh, to, to, that, that will be incorporated in the uh, second edition that weren't in the first edition. And as well, I got feedback from hundreds of users of these guides. Um, this is the first page of the acknowledgments. Uh, there's, I think, three or four pages like this of names of people who have sent me photos, questions, uh, data, interesting observations from their banding stations, and so forth. Okay, some other notable changes. What else? Uh, added 21 new species from part one. These are mostly introduced species, but, um, but also include a couple of species that have, have recently bred or become more regular along our southern border in the United States. Um, for the first edition, the uh, Eurasian collar dove was just starting to expand across North America in 1997. And toward the end of my doing it, um, people said, well, you should include it. And I thought about it and I was like, oh, no, I'm done, I'm done. I don't wanna add Eurasian collar dove. And I kind of hoped they would kind of peter out, the invasion would stop, but it didn't. <laughs> so here it is. Now I'm covering Eurasian collar dove, as well as nine species of parrots. And I realized that not a lot of banding stations catch parrots. However, um, there's a lot of people now becoming interested in aging and sexing just by looking at digital images, which can be almost as good as having a bird in the hand these days. And you can really see every feather and, and identify molt patterns and so forth. So the guide will not just be for banders, but also for those who take uh, photographs of birds and want to be able to age them from those. 
I'm also going to present measurements and tables rather than at the end of the sex couplets of each species. This is what I did for part two, and I think it results in a, a much easier way to compare uh, species, uh, you know, average wing and tail lengths. And, and I've also added exposed colman and tarsus for all of the species, as well as subspecies such as hermit thrush here. Um, the different subspecies where they do vary in in size, I'll include them as well. And then I've also included a lot of people wanted me to include mass or weight. Weights not uh, weight varies a lot uh, by age, sex, and season. So um, it's not as uh, valuable to me as as these measurements. But uh, still, I was able to add it. And here's an example. Uh, oak titmouse, male and female, juniper titmouse. Uh, in this case, the oak titmouse varied by sex, at least according to the data available, whereas the juniper did not. But that might uh, have as much to do as what, what weight data was available in the literature. And by the way, I did go through all of the MAPS data, something like two mil, over 2 million records of birds to help um, define these 95% uh, confidence intervals in, in weights for each for each grouping. Uh, I added 15 new figures by Steve Howell. Um, a lot of the figures um, are on molt, uh, molt patterns within different birds. Um, and also this new uh, thing I've been looking at to age birds, uh, which I call molt clines. And how that works is that in most second year birds in the spring, they have not replaced their primary. So they're all of the same age all the way across. Whereas adults having molted once, undergone a complete molt, if you, with practice, you can see that each of these feathers gets a little bit newer looking as you go out. And, and, and it's actually even more visible in the secondaries because these feathers are relatively protected. Now this, reflects the molt sequence of most birds um, going from P1 out, outward. And this process can take about a month. And then when the primaries hit about P6 here, that's when the secondaries start to molt this way. So there'll also be this contrast between a more worn looking uh, inner primary and a newer looking outer secondary. And then the secondaries molt this way and often there'll be another contrast between S6, the last feather replaced, and S7, which is one of the tertials, which is also more exposed. None of this occurs in uh, first year birds, first cycle birds, because all of these were grown at the same time within the nest. And here you can see an example with clay colored sparrow. These look all the same, whereas you see a subtle uh, increase here and especially here, you see it gets more worn from S1 to darker and better looking by S6. Okay, almost every bar graph has been updated to reflect all this new terminology um, and, and we'll be in the process of revising our maps, prog, uh, and other verification programs to alert birders when they're trying to age or sex a bird say SY here in November, that can't be done. Um, and so that'll be the future when we get, get um, there's some online banding or, you know, programs coming available that were for entry in the field. And the ideal would be you enter a wrong code and it'll immediately tell you that's not okay and please change it. Another rabbit hole I went <clears throat> down was I started looking at subspecies and you know, I included, I think as 2000 subspecies, but a lot of them just simply are not identifiable in the hand. For instance, these four subspecies of bush tits in California um, are just, they're, they're not, I don't know, you can't, there's kind of a rule that you want to be able to identify at least 75% of them, but you can't even identify any of them really. Um, if you have an individual in the hand, they've been described based on big, long series of of specimens where you can see a difference, but it's very minor in a lot of cases. So I went through all of the subspecies 
and used Macaulay again to see how much variation there was in plumage and how marked the differences supposedly were. And I also looked at the MAPS data set to see if changes in or ch described changes in size were actual real or based on just clines um, in size variation. And a lot of times they looked like they were based on clines, in which case there's no way to draw a line between the smaller ones and the bigger ones to describe subspecies. So I threw a lot of subspecies out, <laughs> basically. So this will probably be a, a controversial thing. I'm in the process. I'll be in the process of writing this up at some point. But um, but uh, you know, here are some examples. Horn lark went from 21 described subspecies to 11, um, and so on. Um, so uh, that'll be something that's uh, in the new edition here. Uh, the literature cited and the errata. Um, we decided to put it online um, instead of having it printed in the book. Not only will this uh, reduce the number of pages of the book, so it'll hopefully make it cheaper for everybody, but um, also uh, having the PDFs of the literature cited available online will allow users to quickly locate resources instead of flipping back and through back and forth through fifty pages of literature cited, um, and then copy them out and use them in their papers and so forth. So, so I think this is going to be a, a helpful addition for everybody to be able to, and you will be able to download the PDFs to your computer so you can have them handy and you don't have to be online or in the cloud or whatever to be able to see these. And then also I'll be maintaining an errata of important uh, errors that have been captured. Um, you know, by users, you know, and these are not typos and things, but like the errors that would actually result in misinformation or or a um, or a wrong identification or aging. We, we've had a rata for the other editions, so this will be an online version that I hope to keep up to date. Um, uh, and then they'll also be available at the IBP website. So the latest update, everybody wants to know. Um, the second edition, I actually completed the second edition and got it to the printer this July, but there were supply chain issues at first. And then uh, the word was it would be available now today that they'd ship it out the last week in November. But now they've had a, a issue with the cover. So they had to redo the cover. So now it'll be, three weeks from now that it'll be available. Uh, as Meredith mentioned, um, Beautio Books will be providing it. And I'm kind of I'm kind of tired of mailing out books here, but so we're encouraging people to go to Beautio Books and also to the Avenet website to um, to order copies. And they'll be getting a lot of copies shipped directly from the printer to them. Also, we will we will be having them available here as well. And you can order them from this website, slatecreekpress.com. Currently, it's only got information on ordering part two because part one has been out of print, but we'll be revising this website uh, and, and providing PayPal button and so forth to be able to order them um, through us as well. Okay, and uh, that completes my update here and I'm happy to take questions. Okay. All right. Oops. Turning on my video. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Um, and thank you, Peter. Um, I have compiled questions, and there's a few more trickling in. But um, why don't we start uh, with the first couple? Um, Vicky had asked about Klamath Bird Observatory, a bird observatory creating a, a tabular version. Um, and I think her answer was, her question was actually answered by somebody from CDO. Um, so CJ Flick um, asked, are there recommended websites or observatories that label and show photograph examples of North American birds in the various WR, WRP 8 to 12 codes used within maps? Uh, wow, not the... Not yet. <laughs> We're, you know, it's one of these things. We kind of had to perfect the WRP system first, I think. 
Um, but that's a great idea. Uh, there are, the, you know, there are the equivalent sites that show open wing photos, for instance, um, Paranga, uh, the uh, nature and struck uh, site, I think it's called that from Canada, uh, is cataloging open wing images um, for, for um, you know, for use in aging and sexing, but they, they're using the old bird, bird banding lab, S-Y-A-S-Y. That the the good pages there were started by uh, Marcel Marcel Garbar at McGill University, and now that's been transferred over to the Paranga site. So you can find that online, um, and uh, it they are accepting open wing images now from all over the place. So that's one one resource. Is people are actually starting to put on open wing in, images into eBird for Macaulay as well, um, which is great. However, they're going to be a little bit harder to find there, I think, than at the Paranga site. So, um, so I'd encourage uh, checking both. And then, as far as uh, yeah, at some point um, once we kind of, I think we still have to use WRP for another decade or so to really get it, everybody used to it, um, and so on. And then, and then, but certainly. Paranga maybe or other sites can start labeling those wings with WRP codes as well. Okay. Um, Alan Chartier asked, how can photos of free-flying hummingbirds be accurately assessed for contour molt? Ruby-throated hummingbirds can appear pristine on the surface, but be covered in pin feathers when in hand. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm well aware of that. Um, you have to really look closely to see if there were um, body feathers are are being replaced or not. And I had that problem with the hummingbird paper, especially regarding, well, the preformative molt in males, you know, the feathers get replaced from green to colorful <clears throat> in a lot of areas. And so that was helpful. Um, you can, if you get a good enough shot, see the see the different generations of of uh, feathers, body feathers, and and then the pin feathers as the questioner said are, are hard to see. You can see them a lot easier on when you when you've got the bird in the hand can ruffle it up. Uh, but um, you know, I think you do what you can. And and one thing I did with the hummingbirds is I looked at um, you know, photos through time. And by the way, there were a lot of images of the same bird uh, over time, especially the vagrants. For instance, there was a broad-billed hummingbird in North Carolina that I think was photographed, had over 500 images of this, that one bird, and it stayed for months. So I was able to follow that bird all the way through, uh, through the, with the photographs and was able to see the proportion of new feathers coming in. So that's that's sort of one way to, to be able to assess body feather molt through photos. But by and large, for most birds, it happens quickly and there's not a lot of um, sort of valuable information there as far as uh, aging and so forth. So the, the action occurs really in the wing feathers, and those are a lot easier to assess. All right. Um, <clears throat> so this, the Lori Doss had a question that has sort of been addressed, and then there are some good comments in the chat about it. Um, she asked, as a bander, would it be helpful to put wing shots into eBird when entering banding data along with our normal body shots for future studies? Um, and I'm just because I was just transcribing this one, Eric Johnson made a com comment in the chat that the Louisiana Bird Observatory has started an INAT project with WRP and spread wings. And he has a link to that in the chat, but um, I'll let Peter speak to the original question. Uh, yeah, great. If you're gonna upload body shots, you might as well, I mean, wing shots are so much more valuable for aging and sexing. So definitely, if you're uploading anything, a wing shot, <laughs> but uh, but ideally, for instance, in some of our maps programs, like our boreal maps program, we would take one body shot, one open wing shot, and one uh, shot of the open tail um, to be able to assess the rectrices. So those are the three shots I would recommend um, putting up. And you know, on the body shots, this is another thing. It's it's really good to make sure that the uh, scapulars on the feathers on the on the shoulder don't cover up the primary coverts 
and the greater cover. It's when you take the body shot, because sometimes you can look at the body shot and the open wing and and the body shot will actually help you see those molt limits uh, just as easily as the open wing shot. So, so if you are going to load body shots, have a nice profile, but also make sure that the feathers in the wing are um, are kind of moved back so you can see all of the coverts. And then also, of course, for the wing shots, do your best not to have the thumb and finger right over the primary coverts because I've seen that a lot. But um, you know, uh, great. And um, INET, I hadn't heard of that, but that's great. Um, it's a third resource to go to. And if it's a specific INET kind of page for this project, then then I think that'll be a, uh, end up being a real great source. And I'm sure Eric's going to start putting in WRP codes, right, Eric? <laughs> so uh, so that might uh, help with that with that uh, that question as well. Yeah, it sounds like he he said it is WRP code, so that's great. Um, uh, so Bruce Wilson had a question about molt migration. Um, will failed breeders or non-breeders molt on the breeding grounds? Uh, yeah, uh, the failed breeders and the non-breeders do start molt earlier. Um, no, they won't molt on the breeding grounds, I guess is the answer to that. They They also will probably move away from the breeding grounds they will move earlier. In our molt migration study in Arizona, we found that a higher proportion of the birds that were molt migrants were SYs, I think. Um, I forget exactly what we found, but, but the implication was that we had more, a higher proportion of SYs uh, during uh, 13, 14 months old uh, were, were migrating to molt than ASYs. And we attributed to that to probably being failed breeders or non-breeders because the first year yearling breeders that are one years old are more often going to fail breed or not breed. And so they often will leave earlier. And I think that's uh, what we were seeing in our data that they were leaving earlier, but they do not, I don't think they mold on the, on the breeding grounds. In fact, they, you know, being anthropomorphic here a little bit, I'd say they they tried to breed, they failed. I'd want to get out of there too. I think early as early as possible. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Charlie and Tracy, um, probably mispronouncing the last name, Muse um, asked, "Did you include other resources such as Brinker's discriminant function for sexing northern sawwet owls?" Uh, yeah, when I came across those papers, I did. Uh, I mentioned them see the source for a DFA or whatever analysis they use um, and mentioned which um, which uh, uh, measures were important uh, to take to be able to use those functions. Um, by and large, they're they're useful. They're very, very useful for a given population, but can't necessarily be applied across the entire species range. So, um, so that's just a caution about the use of those. But I did include those. I don't. I, I'd, I'd have to look in for that particular solid owl reference. But, um, but yeah, if if I found them, I'd put them in there. Okay. Um, Dan Wenny with SFBBO uh, asked. Uh, the big question is whether the figure numbers in the second edition are the same as in the first edition. For example, the is the Wilson's warbler crown pattern still figure 281? Our database has many columns for specific figures in the first edition. Oh, geez. Well, I'm afraid you're going to have to. There was no way to keep them the same unless I mixed all the figure numbers around. So no, I, I redid all the figures. Well, plus another thing that happened was the taxonomy and uh, sequence changed around a lot too. So. For instance, vireos weren't aren't near warblers anymore. They're way up in the front, and so on like that. So I I had to change them all around. So you'll have to uh, do something with your database. Okay. Um. Uh. uh the username Kitat or K A I T A T was looking for a best resource on taking pics. The subtle feather feather contrast I see don't show in the photos. And I believe that Lori Doss may be sharing some um, links 
on the chat about that. And then she also asked, um, did I hear that birds of the world will eventually have the same molt summary as this guide? Uh, pretty much. Um, my role at birds of the world, I think I'm trying is to standardize the molts and plumages for all species. And, you know, there's what, 10,000 of them. So if I live to 120, <laughs> I might get there. But um, I think uh, generally that at least the concepts and the terminology is going to all be standardized um, for, for the molt accounts. And, um, you know, I start out each of my plumage sections with how many primaries and secondaries and rectrices each species has. So if you go to a bird of the world account and appearance section and see that at the top, you'll know that I've gone through it. Um, but, you know, there's an awful lot of them still out there that are using old terminology, different terminology, or just plain uh, aren't up to date. So it's going to take a while, but that is the intention. Okay. <clears throat> uh, McKinley Weaver asked, are there plans for an ebook slash PDF version? Uh, kind of, yeah. Um, we, uh, when I gave that talk at Weba, the folks at UC Davis have a whole department on uh, creating uh, a, uh, an <clears throat> app. Uh, so that's kind of the idea is we'll create an app uh, application or a you know, uh, downloadable thing that'll be searchable and, and available on a banner's tablets and so forth. And, you know, of course, one of the advantages there is that all the figures will be instant and tables will be instantly linked. You don't have to flip through the pages to get to them. But I'm gonna, we need to sell a few books before that. And so I'm guessing it's two years off maybe. Okay. Um... Scott Walters asked, are there plans to create an updated version of the photographic companion guide similar to the 20, 2009 Froelich? Uh, no, I don't think so, unless Dan's in, out there and wants to do that. <laughs> um, it is available online, though. Uh, you know, I've had several people asking me how to get a copy of that. We put it up on PDF format. In fact, we just reformatted it so that it'd be double page spread because the format of that book has the photos on one side and the text on the other. Um, and so uh, so it, it is available at our site and you can print it. Okay. Um, Linda, and I hope I'm interpreting this right, um, she asked, uh, will there be a Canadian distributor for the book or CDN? I uh, no, you know, nobody's there. There really wasn't for 90, the 97 version either. Most people ordered on their own. I think, um, uh, what's the Bird Observatory down in British Columbia? Um, they, they'd they order 12 once in a while and I think distribute them within the country. But yeah, it is an issue because the postal charges have gone way up for that. Um, but at this point, uh, no, but if someone wants to email me, um, with some ideas, I'll take it. Um, <clears throat> Manuel asked, how many Mexican species are included now? <laughs> well, the same number is 97 plus about five more, I'd say. Um, so not a big improvement there. And I know, Manuel, you, you have some ideas of doing similar things for uh, Mexico, so go for it. And you know, and there's a lot of it, uh, increasing interest through our MOSI program for banders to compile information on uh, similar information for Mexican birds. However, a Manuel, I did look at subspecies in, in Mexico too. So my revision of the subspecies did include uh, those of, that occur solely in Mexico and Central America. And, um... Mark wanted to clarify, are the WRP codes in the new edition? Uh, yeah, in that format, I, I indicated it's it's a single paragraph with WRP. The codes that are available, that are common or used for that species, and then the month range is to be expected. And so if it has a pre-alternate mulch, it's got those codes. If it doesn't, it doesn't have those codes. Um, and then some of them have as few, like it, the bird, like a bush tip maybe has as few as 
three codes that are available, you know, so it's, um, it, it, it is species specific. Um, I think you already touched on this in one of your previous answers, but John asked, we heard there was going to be an app associated with the new version of the book. Any updates on that? Yeah, I just mentioned it maybe uh, uh, briefly two years from now um, is kind of an idea. We'll see if that happens. But I, yeah, definitely want to have it available in app form um, at some point as soon as it seems reasonable. Okay. Um... Rebecca asks, does the new edition clarify all pre-supplemental molts that were described in species like lazuli buntings in the last edition? Uh, no. <laughs> and basically, that's still a very understudied subject. Um, and I and I haven't been able to really figure it out. I know um, Eric Johnson and others have been working on it and probably have it figured out a lot better for Northern Cardinal, for instance, is one. But um, it's a hard one because, because some of them skip that molt. And so you don't know if there's feather replacement. You don't know if it should be assigned to that molt or the preformative molt. So basically, um, you know, we haven't, we haven't progressed a lot in, in understanding that molt. Um, very well since in the last, since it was first described in the 80s. Okay. Um, let me see. Uh, Marius, and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your name. Um, he asked, uh, where do you measure birds? Did you include Mexico or for example, Guatemala? In our Mexican birds, we found differences between the measurements and wing formula from your books and birds that we have trapped in Mexico. Um, please uh, uh, direct some attention to our relatively new Mexican bird ringing system, birds.mx. Yeah, I mean, go for it, you guys. <laughs> I uh, basically, I got most of my information uh, with specimens, um, probably looked at over 100,000 specimens for the two volumes. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, it definitely migratory birds have longer wings and different um, wing formula, migratory populations within a species than resident uh, populations. And so it's just going to be something that in your Mosey stations and banding and specimen collections, you can start to collect that data. And, and um, you know, I always encourage publication of the data, even if it's in uh, something like North American Bird Banner, which is, you know, easy to write something up quickly and get it in there. And then it becomes available uh, for me and others in the future. Right. Um, Liz asked about um, if there's any or any more evidence for molt migration in Eastern populations. Yeah, that paper I linked in its 2018 at our site shows that, um, well, it's, it, it's, it's a different sort of strategy in the East a lot of species uh, do undergo some sort of movement from the breeding territories to the molting grounds. And we show that, and actually there's a few species in which the Eastern populations are more likely to move away from the, the breeding territory. But um, overall, they don't go as far. In the West, the reason they go to the monsoon region is because the Western North America dries up during July and August every year and insect resources become fewer. Whereas in the monsoonal region of Southeast Arizona and Mexico, there's the rains that begin in July and there's a bloom, a flush of vegetation and insects. So these birds have um, adapted or realized that they get, by migrating in warm plumage to that specific area to molt, they'll have more resources, resources to molt. So you've got, a lot more species in the West that seem to go longer distances between breeding territories and molting grounds. In the East, though, the proportion of birds that move is similar, if not more, in some species. But a lot of them probably just go a few miles or down the block or maybe some dozens of miles to switch habitats to find the right habitat to molt. Whereas in the East, because the habitat is all relatively uniform, um, and conditions are pretty good in August, 
they don't need to undergo these longer longer distance migrations. There are a few though. Indigo mining is one that we don't really have a good handle on where most of those birds molt, even though it's a common and well studied species. Um, Rosebreast or grosbeak. I'm not sure what that would be another possibility for uh, for ones that might uh, fly down to Mexico or to the southern U.S. or someplace. And even in your common species, like they they radio track some wood thrushes, and some of them left, say Pennsylvania, and went to Arkansas to molt. You know things like that. So so there is there is a lot to learn. Swainson thrush, another one where there seems to be a pretty big movement of birds from the boreal northeast region of Canada to the Mississippi Valley to molt. So there's a lot there to still figure out. Um, <clears throat> okay, uh, Hannah asked, are there acceptable WRP codes for known age, known age old returns showing molt limits like young birds? For example, a five-year-old gray catbird, a nine-year-old um, common yellow throat. Uh, yeah, there are codes for those. I don't know about molt limits looking like young birds. <laughs> uh, that's not kind of what we're addressing with that system. But um, but yeah, we use the number. It's in the most recent paper on that. We use the numbers one, two, three, up to nine. So you can go up to nine. Uh, nine, what is it? Uh, nine CB, is that right? Would be a bird in its ninth basic plumage. Um, and it is useful for eagles and condors and albatrosses and a few other things like that that you can age up to 10 years or older. Cool. Um, so we have a, a bit more time. If you have a question, um, you can go ahead and type in the chat or um, so give you a couple seconds to think of one while we still have Peter on the line. Um, and uh, CJ Flick wanted to say thanks and positive thoughts to Dave DeSantis, who gave me meaning to life via the MAPS program. Yeah. Yeah, it was a sad day for us all here. There's a really nice um, bunch of tributes as well at our IBP site that various people around the country that know New Dave well have contributed. So um, you might want to check that out. Yeah. Um, Amy Wilson asked, how would someone from Canada order the book if there's no distributor in Canada? Yeah, I, I addressed that already. Um, I There wasn't really a distributor for the 97 one either. Um, so, so, you know, uh, if someone wants to order a bunch from Canada, send me an email or something and we'll see what we can do. <clears throat> um, Alan asked, do Rufus hummingbirds undergo a molt migration? It looks like they do based on my Great Lakes data, sample size of 130. Uh, yeah, they do, as a matter of fact. Um, they have an interesting molt. So we wrote a Desi Seabirth uh, also at our IBP site. Um, and I wrote a paper in 2018 specifically on the molt of Rufus hummingbird. And it is really interesting. Um, and the birds that are kind of vagrants or, you know, spend the winter in the southeast may may end up doing something different than those that go down to Mexico. But um, by and large, it seems like in the western U.S., a lot of them go down to maybe the high Sierra or high mountains of um, of, uh, of Arizona and um, north northwestern Mexico uh, to molt there before going on to the breeding grounds. Um, uh, but, you know, it'd be interesting to look at that question with all these hummingbirds that are uh, wintering or staying for long periods at feeders. I think in that hummingbird paper, well, in that hummingbird paper, I was able to look at that for those eight species. But, you know, it's something that Macaulay would, you could do with Macaulay uh, for the for the northern species as well. Um. Carol commented, I wonder if Hannah's question refers to birds that we know are an age um, do we know that we know an age four due to banding data rather than birds that we can get a specific age due to plumage. Um, can I use 7CB for a song sparrow that I know is seven years old due to its banding data? Right. If you know it's exactly seven because you um, caught it as a hatch year 
or an SY. I mean, that's a, it would, a lot of them might be after seven years old too, in which case we do have codes for both of those. Um, it would be seven, seven CB for if you know it's seven in its seventh molt cycle. Now that's a little different than years old. So you have to kind of be careful there. Or you could use uh, our new code M minimum uh, six CB means it's it's at least six years old or at least seven years old. However, a uh, caution that the bird banding lab and probably most programs aren't going to be accepting those things. <laughs> so when you do your maps prog or your whatever else you do to schedule your bands, uh, I don't think the BBL is going to like that. <laughs> Um, Manuel asked help. We today we caught a Lincoln sparrow molting on the head, a good proportion. Um, FPX question mark. Oh uh, no. <laughs> um I I'm Manuel lives in Mexico, so I'm presuming it's down there. Um it's either either a continuation of uh either the pre-basic or the preformative molt. Um or maybe it lost a bunch of head feathers accidentally. That's not what you expect, but it, you know, who knows? Lincoln Sparrow might be a molt migrant like everything else. Maybe it molted down there and worn plumage and now you're getting it molting. But it would either be um, probably F FPF or, um, or DPB, one of those two codes. It looks like Vicky suggested MFPF. <laughs> Yeah, if you don't know what age it is, that would be that would be right. If you don't, if you didn't age it. Okay. Um, Rebecca asked any specific changes to the Western Flycatchers account uh, regarding formula descriptors for molt sequence, etc. Uh, let me think. Um, no, you know we revised. I mean, we revised the terminology probably. If if the terminology was wrong, as I described for yellow belly, then I would have I probably did update it for Western as well. And by the way, I, I I'm kind of giving up on Pacific Slope and Cordier. And um story I like to tell is on the Farallons. I worked on the Farallons a long time where we get a lot of vagrants. And um I know we probably get Cordier and flycatchers out there. But you know the sort of default species would be Pacific Slope because they're more common on the coast. So we called them all Pacific Slope. But then we then I was trying to find a Cordilleran and I just could not. And then I realized we really didn't identify any of the Pacific Slopes either because they're. I guess I've given up on even trying to identify those two in the hand. So um, so now we call them all Westerns. And then if any of you get Birding Magazine, there was a recent article in there um saying hey why don't we let's give up on this let's go back to western so i agree with that um let me see oh uh joanna wonder jo sorry johanna asked is the new chihuahuan meadowlark included did I? I it was right at the end i did but it's it's a double heading i think um it's uh eastern well all three I forget. I'm sorry. I could look it up. But um, uh, I think I got it in there. And I think I got it in as three headings east. Oh, no, no. You know what I did? I, I continue to describe it as a subspecies, but I put a note on it that it's now considered a species. So Liliani is now, uh, <clears throat> there's a, a couplet there for the subspecies, but I think I put a bold note at the end saying it's now a species because it was a last minute thing. Um, so sorry, we've got a couple of questions came in at the same time. Um, Trisha was wondering, um, any noteworthy changes in skull ossification dates for any species? A few, um, there's a paper, uh, Eaton, no, who was it? Uh, somebody did a really good paper on that in Wood Warbler since 1997, and I, I put that, incorporated that in, but I would actually say not a lot of updates on those. Um, it's just, it's a hard subject to, to uh, if there was a paper on it in, there's been a few papers in North American bird banners and stuff that have looked at it in more detail, but it's a kind of hard subject to, 
to do because of the variation across the whole continent in the timing of breeding and and rates of ossification among species. So uh, it, you'll probably find it's largely the same. Uh, it looks like Manuel offered to help with Mexican distribution of the book if you need it. So, um, but it looks like also um, I think people are kind of needing to sign off. So um, I think we'll probably wrap it up here unless anybody has any last second questions. Peter, do you have anything else you want to add? Uh, no, nope, just uh, thanks all for for joining in on this and. You know, the guide will be available um, here by the end of this year. So keep checking those uh, booksellers and appreciate uh, purchases of them. And we'll continue this long journey of furthering our understanding of molts and plumages and aging of birds. Great. Well, thank you so much, Peter, for a really great presentation and everybody who's on the meeting and asked excellent questions. Um, uh, we really appreciate it. So, um, all right. Well, I will let everybody get back to what they were doing. Um, and thanks for being here. Thanks all. Bye. Good banding. <laughs> <laughs>